I've been uh, surprised and delighted to actually hear how successful BioCity has been. I'd also like to make, uh, just, to reaff just to agree wholeheartedly with Glenn's comments about um, uh, openness. Um, I I've often found that, that uh, it, you, you can go into different companies and there are some that are closed and some that are open. And quite often people won't give you the answer to a question because they, it's actually a difficult question, but they plead commercial secrecy. And in fact, um, that's a very bad move really, because actually you'd rather people were totally open and told you as much as possible. Obviously there are some things that you can't go into great detail about, but generally it's much better to answer the question. So I shall attempt to answer a number of questions as I go through this uh, talk. So, what I'm going to talk about is, is uh, antibody pharmaceuticals, uh, their rise, and my view on their future. And I've put at the bottom some disclosures. In, uh, in medical circles now, it's absolutely required. You have to declare every possible uh, commercial interest you've got. Actually, I've also got some shares in GSK and AstraZeneca, but I didn't think it was worth mentioning those. But I do have some interest in some startup companies. Um, so I thought I'd just better mention those and have it on record that I had mentioned them. So I'm going to start, since I gather this is a mixed audience, I thought I'd very quickly uh, just go uh, uh, through a few preliminaries. Um, the work I'm going to, to describe relates to uh, um, essentially two polymers, polynucleotides and polypeptides. And as you know, in the case of uh, double-stranded DNA this is the material of the genes, and its main function is to encode. It produces single-stranded RNA, which then goes off to uh, uh, encode proteins. And whereas, for example, if we look at the structure of DNA, we've got a complementary arrangement of nucleotides, which in fact means that this molecule can fold up into a double helix because the dimensions across the backbone are very uh, similar. In the case of proteins, um, that is not true. In the case of proteins, there is, um, there is no complementarity between individual amino acids. And if you have a selection, of, if you have a protein, which I've represented in different amino acid side chains of different shapes, um, these end up collapsing together to give a folded protein. So in fact, the structures of proteins differs very much one from the other, and essentially it's due in good measure to the packing of those side chains on each other and a certain amount of hydrogen bonds between these, between the different parts of the main backbone. And these proteins are the main workhorses of the cell. Now, Crick frames uh, what's come to be known as a central dogma, <coughs> but actually is not a dogma, it's a hypothesis um, which has subsequently been fairly well validated. And he pointed out that basically the flow of information is DNA makes RNA makes protein. Double-stranded DNA to single-stranded RNA to protein. And that has certain implications, practical implications. Um, when cloning was developed, it, 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 because the, the genetic code is universal um, in humans and, uh, and, 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 and bacteria, uh, if, you've got a, if you've got the information in the DNA, uh, if, you put a, if you take a human gene and you clone it in a bacteria um, or into an animal cell, for example, CHO cells, you can get those animal cells to express the corresponding human protein. That protein is as human as would be expressed if it's in a human cell. And this actually, uh, um, the first uses of this for practical application were in production of recombinant insulin by Genentech, human growth hormone, again by Genentech, uh, and erythropoietin, uh, which is a thing the cyclists were taking, as well as being used for treatment of uh, um, uh, various anemias, and that was developed by Amgen. And this was really a success story of the 1970s to early 80s. Now, in fact, this led Sidney Brenner to co coin uh, the central dogma of coin Sidney Brenner, which is DNA makes RNA makes protein makes money. Uh, and really, uh, this you know, kind of this technology underpinned the whole development of Genentech and Amgen as, as a mega uh, 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 profitable biotechnology companies. So now, there's another indication of this. That is, that if DNA makes RNA makes protein, then if you can change the DNA, 
uh, and you will thereby change the RNA, and therefore you can make a variant protein, an altered protein. And that uh, is uh, essentially by engineering, altering the DNA, you can engineer proteins. So when I talk about protein engineering, that's what I'm talking about. And here, um, the, again, the idea is if you, take, if you take your synthetic or altered DNA, you can put the altered gene into cells, you can get the cells to make, express the altered protein. And in fact, in this area, the very biggest application, in fact, totally dominating application, has been uh, making therapeutic antibodies. Uh, these have also had a massive impact in biotech and in the large pharmaceutical companies. And I'll explain a bit more about that later. So hang on. Uh, okay, so this just shows you some of the um, antibodies that have been developed as pharmaceuticals. So this, if we, the main areas of application have been in cancer and in the treatment of immune disorders. And what we can see here, this was an antibody that was uh, developed um, for treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and has subsequently been used for other purposes. Um, but this was actually in 1988, this was one of the very first genetically engineered antibodies, well, actually it was probably the first genetically engineered antibody in humans, it was a collaboration between myself and Herman Waldman in Cambridge. Um, and this shows a patient with a grossly enlarged spleen. It's grossly enlarged because you have uh, essentially this huge mass of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, um, of lymphoma the white cell proliferation in the spleen. And as a result of being able to, uh, um, uh, as a result of antibody treatment, um, this shows that there is actually almost complete uh, uh, loss of the uh, mass of tumor. So this is zero. Um, this red line is actually after 10 days of treatment. And then finally, um, uh, it, in fact, this picture is taken at the 30 day, the 30 day uh, uh, time. So this, this was, a, this was an NHS, NHS hospital, and um, you can see after 30 days they haven't washed off the lines, so they're, they're, still, they're, still, they're still there, but actually, I mean, this showed we could blow away a very large mass of tumor by, um, uh, 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 by using this antibody. Now, in fact, there's some very good reasons why, in that particular case, the result shows that you can attack a very large uh, a tumorous mass, and I think there's, there's kind of two reasons why antibodies have been so successful in that, first of all, the spleen is highly vascularized, and secondly, it contains the cells necessary for the killing activities of the white cells, and I'll come on to that in a minute. So this is not what you would normally expect to see with a solid tumor, but it's certainly, in the case of um, uh, uh, um, lymphoma, you can have dramatic effects, and actually you can also use it for treatment of other cancers, breast cancer, or septin, for example, is one of these therapeutic antibodies. The other area that um, has been developed uh, for, for um, as far, where antibody pharmaceuticals have been developed is the uh, uh, is for treatment of immune disorders, and this lists some of those diseases. And what I've marked here is the dramatic effect of treatment of plaque psoriasis by um, systemic injection of uh, Humira, that's adalimumab, um, which was a product which we developed in Cambridge Antibody Technology. <coughs> So this is a sort of pretty much untreatable psoriasis. Essentially, you can greatly uh, diminish its effect by the treatment with antibody. But it's been used for all sorts of other things, um, uh, the treatment of transplantation rejection, rheumatoid arthritis, which perhaps is the biggest area of treatment, even now osteoporosis, and even going through to multiple sclerosis. So antibodies <coughs> are actually uh, um, hitting over a wide range of disease states, but particularly cancer and immune disorders. So first of all, I thought I'd just better tell you a bit about antibodies, <coughs> because you might wonder how these molecules came to be made. And this is really uh, to remind you that um, antibodies are part of our natural defense against viruses and bacteria. Uh, they're not normally used for treating uh, um, uh, um, cancer in their natural form, they're for treating infectious disease. And essentially what happens is the, the virus comes in, it, it's, it's encounter with the immune system, provokes the production of antibodies from B cells, and each B cell ends up producing a different antibody. So this ends up creating 
a, you know, a large spectrum of antibodies directed against the pathogen. And they exert their effect in uh, uh, um, two major different ways. So the antibody is a, is a Y-shaped molecule. Um, the first instance, this region, which I've marked as V, um, the so-called variable regions, binds to the target antigen, so part of the virus or bacterium. And, and this binds through loops at the tip. And that act of binding can itself be quite sufficient to stop the activity of the pathogen. Essentially, it's like, you know, I was asked last week, how would I explain this to four-year-olds? And I said, well, actually, that's quite difficult. But, but maybe it's like throwing sticky jelly at a pathogen. So it just gums it up. Essentially, it binds to it, sticks on it, and the pathogen can't move about. So that is one mechanism by which the antibodies work. But there's additional <coughs> mechanisms they have. Um, and this is, the, uh, this is the one that people tend to, 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 to think is the main action. Um, and this is by uh, essentially binding to the target, and then, f then this end here acting as a flag to the immune system, basically saying, come and get me. And it leads to, it attracts a variety of cells, neutrophils, macrophages, natural killer cells. All of these have different sets of receptors, and they've all got different ways of killing. So NK cells will release perforins, which will punch holes in membranes. Uh, uh, um, macrophages will take in and digest the pathogen, and uh, uh, neutrophils can end up producing free radicals, peroxides, superoxides, etc. So there is a, a binding and then a killing action. Now, so that's the main way the antibody works, but there is, there's actually another feature that I should also explain that's important to understand why these are such potent pharmaceuticals. And that is, uh, the antibody has a long serum half-life. So having made these, takes about 10 days to make an antibody, uh, you, 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 don't, you don't really uh, um, want to lose them um, uh, 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 you know, in, 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 in a short period. And so antibodies have a half-life in the range of two weeks to, 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 to a month. And they achieve that half-life in two ways. The first thing is they're large, so they're 150 kilodaltons in molecular weight. And that means that they don't get filtered through the kidneys. So things, for example, less than about 50,000 can go through the kidneys. Uh, antibodies don't go through the kidneys, and therefore they avoid that natural route of loss. However, there is also another feature that you need to know about with antibodies that confers their half-life, and that is that uh, in the serum, in the blood, um, the um, Endothelial cells are constantly sipping small amounts of serum at random. So it's like a process of cleaning up the blood. Endlessly taking small samples in, it's called pinocytosis, and they take the material, whatever it captures, whether it's pathogen, whether it's your own serum proteins, it takes them in and digests them. So actually, um, if in the case of antibodies, though, it, it, obviously there's no point in creating something and then digesting it like an antibody. So actually, there is, a, there is a cellular mechanism which involves the binding of the antibody, about this position here, to a, an intracellular receptor. And that intracellular receptor captures the antibody that's sort of otherwise getting doomed for digestion and takes it out and throws it back onto the cell surface. So those are called recycling receptors. And they have a big effect. So to give you an idea of the scale, if you take an animal that lacks those recycling receptors, you will find the antibody will only survive about 24 hours in a mouse. Um, and if you, if you want to get, but of course the size is also has a major contribution. So basically, um, if you take a small molecule that gets filtered through the kidney, the half-life would be in the order of about 10 minutes in a mouse. So you can, so, you know, each of those has an effect. You've got the, the large size, which stops you being filtered by the kidney, but then additional mechanisms that really push the half-life right out to in the order of two weeks to a month. So those are, the, those are the key features of an antibody. And obviously some years ago, people wondered, in fact it was more than 100 years ago, it was about the, the mid-1890s, people wondered if you could, <coughs> once they realized that you could make antibodies against infectious disease by immunizing an animal, they wondered if it would be possible to turn antibodies against cancer. 
And so there were some French, whose names I've forgotten actually, um, but they decided to take human cancers, inject them into horses, and then take the antiserum and inject that back into humans. And um, I, I think they probably didn't kill anybody, but um, uh, it didn't really work. And, and there's a sort of number of reasons for that. Um, and what I'd like to, to explain is how, how, why that didn't work, and, 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 and where the issue, uh, you know, in other words, how, the, how technology has advanced to, to, to allow us to nevertheless use that approach. So let's take the case, if you take a, a mouse, and you imagine immunizing that mouse with human cancer cells, the mouse does make antibodies against the cancer cells, but cancer cells to the immune system, human cancer cells in a mouse, so it reacts them, recognizes these as being foreign. Um, actually, human cancer cells look much like an ordinary human cell. So actually, um, yes, the mouse makes antibodies against the unique cancer antigens, but actually the vast majority of things on the surface of that cell are, 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 normal, are found on normal cells. So actually, if you were to take, um, if you take that antiserum and you put that into humans, effectively you're just attacking your normal cells and you have a very tiny effect on the cancer, but the biggest effect is going to be on normal cells. So the straight antiserum, which is this sort of spectrum of antibodies that gets produced in the serum, it's hopeless for being able to target human cancer cells uh, um, selectively. Now in the mid-70s, Cesar Milstein developed hybrid over technology to make uh, monoclonal antibodies. And what this technology involved was, um, for the case of cancer, you immunize uh, the mouse and then you would, you would immortalize the different antibody producing cells by fusion to a myeloma cell. And each one of those would produce an antibody. Then you'd screen those antibodies and you'd find just those antibodies that attack the cancer cell. And so that was thought to be this is going to be the big magic bullet. So I was around in the 1970s. I was just a, a sort of PhD student then. Um, and there was a big feeling that this would be, you know, the solution to cancer. But it didn't work out. And the reason was that in, in, in the patients, if you give them these mouse antibodies, they do start to kill the tumors. And in fact, the reason I put a 10-day line on that slide of Canpath um, was that you normally can get about 10 days worth of therapy before the immune system reacts and recognizes these mouse antibodies as foreign and produces human antibodies against the mouse antibodies and blocks the therapy. So for extended therapy, you need to have, uh, basically you need to have genuine human antibodies against those human uh, cancer targets. But there's an intrinsic problem there, because actually uh, we are primed, our immune system is constructed so as not to make antibodies against our own antigens. In fact, if it does happen, for example, myasthenia gravis uh, is one such disease where you end up making human antibodies, your own, own antibodies, against um, the, the, the junction between nerve and muscle, and this leads to paralysis. <coughs> um, so actually, you do not want to make, the immune system is set up by mechanisms I don't want to go into, and I only dimly recollect, um, uh, but, but, but set up to ensure that you do not make antibodies against uh, um, uh, 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 your own self. So how, how is one going to do that? How can we overcome this intrinsic problem? And the approach was really to use uh, genetic engineering. And so what I've tried to show here is um, maybe one could make antibodies, uh, one could take those mouse antibodies. So unfortunately, I don't have the equivalent slide with, a, with a, a mouse, so I've had to use a chimp to show you the animal dimension to this. So if we take this uh, sort of original animal antibody, we need to turn it and make it, you know, turn it into human-like, so this is Neanderthal, I suppose, uh, and finally into man. So how, how, could, how could we achieve that? And, um, and this is just to show you that the antibody structure, which I've shown, has a series of domains. You've got these variable domains at the end, and you've got a series of other domains called constant domains, including those which have got the, um, recruit the cells in. Um, these are very nicely mirrored at the level of the, of the genes. So actually, um, in the early days, when it was more difficult to, to uh, uh, when in fact we had very little synthetic DNA available, it was much easier, uh, you could use restriction enzymes to cut and paste um, these genes together. So you could try pasting these genes here, for example, onto 
human genes. So I'll just show you this um, in, the, in the next slide. We have that modular structure, and I want to deal with this part of the process. How can we, can we go up to Neanderthal man stage um, and beyond? So just going up to Neanderthal man now. So if we start off with our mouse antibody, uh, we've got all these, we've got the, the, the genes for the heavy chains, the genes for the light chains, there's two chains of construct. Um, if we take those, this region here, which we've made our mouse hybridoma, which is reacting against the human cancer cell, we can stitch that onto constant genes taken directly from humans. These are the same in all humans, so we can, if we take the constant region genes from humans and stick those onto a, um, a, the, the antigen uh, binding regions of a mouse antibody, we can end up making these so-called uh, chimeric antibodies. And that was the first stage. The, the stage, this is the stage which I got involved. Um, I, for other reasons that I won't go into, um, I, I, I was, uh, um, I'd been involved with engineering enzymes, and I was looking at the, 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 the antibody as a possible scaffold for building novel enzymes. Um, what I looked, what I noticed was all antibodies, these V regions, which carry antigen binding activity, have got a very similar structure. So they've got these beta sheets, which are marked here, with these loops at the end. And if you compare a mouse antibody with human antibody, these regions, although they may be different in sequence here, actually um, are almost identical in structure. So you can superpose, crystallographically, you can superpose uh, this area here, which is basically a scaffold for these loops, these six loops, which plug in the end. And I wondered, huh, maybe if we just took the antigen binding loops from the mouse antibody rather than the entire uh, region here, we could create what I call a humanized antibody that is much less immunogenic. And so this is the idea. Essentially, we just carry over the antigen binding loops and we plug these into the framework regions of a complete human antibody. So now this antibody is about two-thirds human, this one's about 95% human. And so this was the, uh, the kind of the first approach, and that worked, um, it, you can certainly do it. It, it. It's more complex than making the chimeric. You have to be aware how, sorry, you have to be aware how you're plugging the loops in. You've got to make sure they fit properly into the, if the scaffold, there may be a few adjustments to make in the scaffold in order to make the right, uh, to, in order to give it the, the binding activity of the mouse antibody. So now I'd like to um, deal, so, so far we basically, I would say, we've got up to Neanderthal man, and now uh, suppose we wanted to make human antibodies, because we're now talking about the early 1990s, and we actually didn't know whether this Neanderthal man would, 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 the, whether it would really fool the immune system. So at that stage, we had some preliminary results that were promising, but we really just didn't know whether it was going to be good enough. So we wondered, I started to think about, well, how would we make genuine human antibodies without worrying about the mouse at all to, to uh, you know, if, 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 if somehow, you know, how could we build them? And so sort of thinking about it, the, the strategy we took is perhaps akin to that of a master thief. So if you imagine, um, an antibody, uh, let's imagine we can view an antibody as a key, and, um, and a, a, the antigen, the virus or bacterium or cancer cell is the lock. What we needed to do is we needed to be able to uh, um, find a key that fits the lock. So that's what it's in, in essence about. And the way that a master thief would do that would just be you'd make a huge bunch of keys, all of different shapes, and then you try them all out. Okay? So, this, so therefore, if we're going to do that, um, how would we make, there were two, issues, two problems we had to sort out. How would we create a huge diversity of genuine human antibodies? And then secondly, how would we interrogate them to find out which was the one that would work? So this shows the strategy that we used. So let's imagine, so this is a, this is a human lymphocyte, so we, we say, okay, we'll get the antibodies from humans, but we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to make these against the human cell antigen. So let's imagine we've got cell A; it produces antibody heavy and light chain. So the two chains come together at the very end, and they jointly create the, the antigen binding site. So this particular combination 
is what's important for the antigen binding activity. So this is cell A, which I've marked with red and with um, white. Um, now, uh, um, this is another, this is, this is a different cell, and this actually is producing a, um, a, a, different, a, um, a different antibody, a, a different antibody specificity. So this is what, the, this is what is produced uh, uh, um, in one cell, this is what's produced in another cell. I suppose we said, let's just take those genes out from those two different cells and just shuffle them. We would create, we would expect to get back the original combination, but we'd also get new combinations that did not exist in, this, in either cell A or cell B. So if you imagine we were to take, um, let's say, 100 different cells, um, so a hundred different original combina hundred different original combinations. If we made all possible combinations of those, you'd have a hundred times a hundred uh, um, uh, uh, in total, minus the hundred you'd started off with. So by taking a large number of cells, you can generate a huge amount of of diversity. So essentially, by taking um, the lymphocytes from human serum and just amplifying using the polymerase chain reaction, um, all of the genes in each of just smashing the cells open and amplifying the heavies and lights and just throwing them together at random, you can generate a vast number of original of, of new combinations, as well as of course there's some chance you'll get the original combination back, depending on the number of cells you've got there and the efficiency the si the size of your the size of your library. So one thousand different cells would give you a million different antibodies. And that's that's a lot. And and the majority of those would have new combinations that had, were not present in the human, and therefore potentially haven't been uh, um, edited out by the human immune system, which is detecting things, uh, antibodies against self. So now we had to work out how could we, uh, now, okay, so we can make libraries very easily, we can make libraries of a billion different, or, or you know, a, 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 a thousand billion different antibodies, very, very easily, just a drop of a hat. But okay, but then how do we find the one we want? And that's, that's more difficult. But initially, we tried plating them and screening them, but it's just impossible. But the, in the end, the solution turned out to be a method that had been developed by an American scientist for small peptides, and we showed it would apply to antibodies. So what we did was to take those heavy and light chain genes, the, ver the variable regions which encode the antigen binding activities, and to uh, clone those into a filamentous bacteriophage. And we call this a phage antibody, we've cloned it so that they're fused to a minor coat protein of the virus. So these things, the antibodies now, instead of being stuck on a B cell, are actually stuck on a bacterial virus. So we've actually got a linkage between the phenotype, what this is, and the, the genotype of the virus. So how does that help us? Well now, because we've got that linked, we've actually got the key elements required for Darwinian evolution. So if you link a phenotype and a genotype, you can apply a pressure on the phenotype, and that's what we did. So if you take, for example, a column of antigen, so this might be one of the, this might be a cancer antigen, and you've got in there one of those viruses, which is a, one of those viruses which might bind to it, you can pull this down the column, and the one that you want will stick. And you wash all the others out, and uh, you can then elute that, you can then put in more acid pH, for example, and get this one off. So you end up with, um, now in fact, inevitably, you, with any kind of separation space method, you never get 100% selection. You're always going to have to have, you're always going to have some of these others contaminating it. And typically, we could get about a thousand fold enrichment of, if we did a sort of spiking with a binder with a sea of non binders, we get about a thousand fold enrichment. But because we've got a linkage between genotype and phenotype, we can now just take those ones which we enriched, put them in some broth, grow that broth up again, and produce some more of those, the enriched population, stick it down another column. And now we get a, another thousand-fold enrichment, so we get a million-fold enrichment. And we can just keep repeating this process, so in the end, for, even if you've got a, you know, a, a thousand billion different antibodies um, on those phages, you can just go three or four cycles of selection and you can pull out the ones you want. And so that was the, uh, so that was the approach which was developed um, by, um, in the lab and, and in conjunction with Cambridge Antibody Technology. And then what we can do is, having got those variable regions, 
we could pull, pull them out, they're human variables, and stick them into a complete human antibody just by pasting it together with human genes, expressing that in an animal cell. So I also thought I would tell you that with that library-based approach, uh, we could also, um, we could, it also gave us an idea of um, another way of humanizing antibodies. Now there, there is a, 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 a paradox which, which the Greeks, the Greeks like their philosophers, they like to invent paradoxes and worry about those kind of things, but the, the, the paradox in its original form was Theseus sets off into the Aegean with his ship and comes back 10 or 20 years later, I can't remember. Um, but that ship, of course, um, went through rough seas, etc. And during the course of its voyage, let's suppose every single timber was replaced, which it probably was. Um, now, when that boat comes back, is that the same boat or not the same boat? So that's the paradox, the ship of Theseus paradox raised by the ancient Greeks. And the, the, other, um, the other way of looking at it, so it has a modern embodiment in the terms of grandfather's axe. Your grandfather had an axe and you've inherited it, but your father changed the top of the axe and you've changed the stem of the axe. So is that your grandfather's axe? Now we decided we could take advantage of this paradox, because we could also be philosophers, um, uh, to, to, to turn a mouse antibodies into human. And this shows the approach. We take a genuine mouse antibody and we want to make it human, so we take our original heavy and light chain pairings we can take our heavy chain, shuffle that with human light chains. We can fish out a pairing that binds to our target antigen. And then we can shuffle it again with a heavy chain library and shuffle this one out. So in fact, we end up with a series of leads which correspond to uh, uh, genuine human antibodies. So this is, the, this is the sort of the grandfather's axe. We've done two stages of shuffling. And because we had very powerful selection methods, we could start off with a mouse antibody and turn that into a human antibody as an alternative to doing, maybe just making a very large library and selecting those that we wanted. And in fact, this was the method that was used to create Humira. This is the now, uh, um, this is one of the, this was the big antibody product made by Cambridge Antibody Technology. And in fact, um, it wouldn't necessarily be the way you do it now, but actually it does work, and it's a very interesting approach, and in fact it's, it's a very successful approach. So what I've described here is this sort of evolution of antibodies from their early stages, antiserum through the Roman monoclonals, all the way through to the creation of human antibodies. And if we look at the, the therapeutics that have emerged from those, uh, this is a timeline, 1994 was the very first one, which was a chimeric, um, and this is the smallest class of, of, of engineered antibodies. And, um, and the largest class, I think, is still the humanized antibodies, which are in many successful products. Um, even, for example, at, at Temra, which was, um, I think, approved in 2010. But there's clearly a developing class now of these human antibodies, of which Humira was the, the first. There are actually, there's another way of making human antibodies um, developed in part by, by Michael Neuberger and Marianne Brueggemann, who was also in Cambridge, and they, they uh, decided to engineer the mouse. They put the human antibody genes in a mouse, and so that mouse, when you immunize the mouse, the mouse will produce human antibodies. So that's an alternative way, and a very successful way of doing it. But it was, it was technically more complex, surprisingly, than the, the approach that we developed, which was a very simple kind of in vitro use of bacterial systems. So this shows you um, where we are now with the uh, with the antibody uh, with with antibody uh, 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 pharmaceuticals. Um, I've listed here uh, the the sales of a variety of products. So um, this is this is the top sort of ten sales of any pharmaceutical in the world, worldwide sales. And this was 2010. And at the top there was Lipitor, as you might expect. You can see another statin, Crestor, down here. And these are sales, 10.7 billion, etc. down. But actually, I've marked in black sales of antibodies. So what you'll see here is that antibodies are now much bigger sellers than, um, uh, in terms of total global sales, than the standard chemical drugs. And this is really quite surprising. And Humira, that this is a figure for 2010, that was the last occasion I could be bothered to work my way through all the charts of sales figures. Um, 
But in 2010, Humira is now the world's top selling product. In part, um, that's at nine billion dollars <coughs> per year, but in part that's because some of the chemicals have come off patent. So Lipitor is off patent, and this has therefore meant the antibodies, which for various reasons I'll come into later, uh, tend to have a longer patent half-life, or let's say regulatory half-life. So this has been absolutely dramatic, and it's quite strange really that we've, we've got a position where, where we, the sort of whole pharmaceutical world has been taken over, but it, pharmaceutical companies play very little role in it. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that the antibodies are about 300 times bigger than conventional chemicals. They're digested, they have to be injected. Um, actually, the pharmaceutical companies didn't see these as being a serious pharmaceutical, because to them, you know, that's not, you know, the kind of thing they had in mind was something you'd take as a pill. That's what they meant by a pharmaceutical. This was just rubbish. This was, well, you know, why would we ever just want to inject these things? So, in fact, it's interesting to compare the features of antibodies and chemicals and their advantages and disadvantages. So let's look, first of all, I've marked in red the disadvantages of each class. So let's look at chemicals. What advantages do they have? Why, do, why were pharmaceutical companies so fixated? I think there are a number of advantages chemicals have over antibodies. One is they can fit into pockets, in particular, they're very good at going into the active sites of enzymes. They get outside the blood, so they can get outside of the vasculature, and they can uh, very efficiently, they, 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 they aren't, they aren't um, prevented by the sort of um, uh, uh, membranes around the blood vessels. They can get into the tissues outside the blood, and furthermore, um, many of them can get inside cells, so you can target things inside cells. You can eat them, which makes it very convenient and not very painful to, to, be, uh, to be treated with them, and you can synthesize them chemically. So this was what a pharmaceutical company saw as being, you know, what a pharmaceutical was. Actually, but you know, antibodies have some other advantages <coughs> compared with chemicals. Um, so antibodies tend to bind because they've got a very, they've got a big protein surface, they tend to bind very strongly. You've got a large protein surface, you can make many interactions with your target antigen, and that means that you can get a very high binding affinity. Chemical drugs, quite often, don't have a terribly high binding affinity. They're small, they make relatively few contacts compared to uh, the kind of number of contacts that an antibody can make. Um, they're very specific, so because you've got a large surface, any um, difference between one protein and another is, relatively, is easily picked up by antibodies. Um, small molecule drugs tend to fit into any kind of cavity that's hanging about. They tend to be fairly hydrophobic and they'll go into cavities to, to things that you don't want to interfere with. So one of the biggest issues with chemical drugs has been you spend a lot of money in developing them and then you find in a phase three trial there's some uh, off-target uh, 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 effect, for example, of Viox or whatever, that's doing something else you didn't expect. Actually, antibodies tend to do, if they've got a toxicity, as they can indeed have a toxicity, it tends to be, um, uh, it's a pharmacological toxicity, it relates to the particular target you're interfering with. The other thing antibodies have is a long serum half-life, uh, so you can give a antibodies every month, um, come down again, you recruit cell killing, so you're bringing in all sorts of other activities uh, which you can, where, where you can um, um, uh, have a therapeutic action. And the other thing is that, that because antibodies have a large surface, they can block protein-protein interactions. So for example, if you think about um, TNF interacting with TNF receptor, these are very, two very big protein surfaces coming together. You try to get a small molecule to intervene in that and to block it, actually it gets squeezed out. Whereas an antibody is big enough that it can coat one or the other of them and prevent those two parties actually being able to come together. So actually, antibodies have got a number of <coughs> advantages, as well as, clearly, some disadvantages here. So if we look at the, 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 you know, what happened in the early commercialization and the development of the work, um, what, what happened at the early stage, essentially, Oh, because, the, because, they're, because the pharmaceutical companies did not recognize the paradigm, um, that their paradigm had changed, actually all of this work largely came from biotech and from academic laboratories. Genentech, Celltech, um, you know, Stanford University, the Medical Research Council. 
Uh, so the, that, that, that was their contribution to chimeric antibodies. The humanized antibodies particularly came out of the Medical Research Council and then were picked up by a series of biotech companies. Um, they were not picked up by the large pharmaceutical companies, even several years into their development. The human antibodies, again, the new approaches for making human antibodies, whether they're by the, the phage display method I described or by uh, the human mice, um, largely emerged, all these technologies emerged from the MRC, the Scripps Research Institute, uh, the AFRC labs in Babraham, and Cambridge Antibody Technology. Um, now, it did have a partner program, but it had it with BASF Pharma, which was not really, not a large pharmaceutical company, a relatively modest sized pharmaceutical company, and Human Genome Sciences, which was a biotech company. And all of the other companies involved in the uh, transgenic mice, the engineered mice, the, the human mice, were all um, uh, companies which were small uh, biotech companies. But large pharma did come in, it, it because it has a large checkbook, so it could just write a check and buy these companies. So Roche bought Genentech, uh, UCB, uh, actually a modest sized Belgian company, bought out Celtech, AstraZeneca bought Medimune, AstraZeneca also by, bought uh, Cambridge Antibody, Abbott bought BASF Pharma, a much bigger company, GSK bought Human Genome Sciences, so all these little players up here you can see are just being taken off the board by the large pharmaceutical companies. Bristol Myers bought the Menorex mice, um, and then here, which is the thing I was involved with, GSK bought Demantis, but that's not any technology I've described so far. So actually that was, um, I think what that sort of shows to me is that, that in some ways you'd think a pharmaceutical company would be your natural, would, would understand the technology best if you come up with some new ideas. In fact, they're probably the last people. And they quite often say, look, if it's really good, at the early days, AstraZeneca said to me in the early 1990s, well, if it really works out great, we'll just buy you. And actually, they were right. They, 15 years later, they bought us. It didn't help us at all at the beginning, when we could really have done with some help. But in the end, we got an Australian company to help us with that. Um, so the summary to date is really this technology innovation of, of making human and humanized antibodies using genetic engineering really unlocked the field of therapeutic antibodies. Um, there are now many highly potent antibodies uh, they can be made actually much faster than chemical drugs. You can use any of these processes, uh, could usually you can get something highly potent within less than a year. And that takes a lot longer if you're starting with a chemical drug to your screens. And the market is now about $40 billion per year, and it's got a compound annual growth rate of about 12%, which um, I don't know what small molecules are, but I think that's near 8%, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure of that. It's lower than antibodies. So then what, what further innovation could we be thinking about? What further opportunities are? Is that the end of the antibody story? So we've got human antibodies, is there anything else we can do? Well, in fact, there is. And this is what I'm going to discuss in the rest of my talk. So one possibility is to make more potent antibodies. And so if I've marked here, the, this is the advantages of antibodies compared with small molecule drugs in green and in red. And what I've done is I've said, okay, one approach is you could try to play to the strengths of antibodies. You could, those things which are good, you could make even better. So let's look then at binding to a target. So these are the critical regions of the antibody. Well, people are making bigger and bigger libraries. Um, uh, they've got more and more potent ways of screening, screening billions of antibodies very successfully for their binding affinity. And so in fact, this is just technology driven um, we can now make very, very high affinity antibodies. And the classic requirement of a large pharmaceutical company for a novel antibody would be in the picomolar range. So, you know, 10 to the minus 12 molar range, you know, it's really quite, quite potent. Um, whereas the early antibodies were probably in the nanomolar range, or, or actually multiple single digit nanomolar. The other issue is. Uh, can one improve, you know, they already have a long half-life, can one improve the half-life? So if we look here, um, this is the region that I mentioned binds to the recycling receptor. So various people have thought, could we create, if suppose we made that capture process more efficient, by tweaking the antibody at this point, so it's more efficiently rescued and thrown out of the cell. Only Medimune have succeeded in doing that. They, scientists in Medimune have now made antibodies which have got mutations in this region. They bind to the recycling receptor more effectively. 
and it throws them back out of the cell. And so now they're talking about antibodies with half-lives of two months rather than one month. Now, again on the question of recruiting cell killing, um, this is the natural cell killing, the receptors to these cells bind in this region here. And in fact, it's quite possible, it's been shown that you can improve the potency, you can improve the interaction of, of, of this region of the antibody with the cellular receptors on the killing cells by um, making changes in the antibody at this point, but also actually um, there are some sugars in the antibody that are actually located around here, and changes in those sugars can also give you much more potent antibody uh, binding activities, more killing activity. So, for example, afugicide antibodies, which you can make by growing up in cells which lack, which lack the enzymes which would put on fucos, are actually turn out to be much more potent at killing by going through the, uh, by going through the receptors on NK cells. So actually, you can make antibodies now, which are 100 times more potent, so you get 100 times lower concentration to get the same killing activity in vitro. They've yet to be proved that that really matters in vivo in proper clinical trials, but it looks extremely promising. So those are kind of one set of approaches to try to improve antibodies. All of those are being developed. Another approach is we could add some extra functions. So we've got these, these with advantages I've got already. But, in fact, maybe one can actually introduce some extra killing activities. And this is an approach that's been taken by Genentech. So what they've done is they've coupled in a toxic chemical drug at this point, something extremely toxic. And so basically, uh, the antibody can kill a cancer cell either by recruiting the other cells in, or if the cell actually manages to escape that by internalizing the antibody, um, and thereby taking the antibody out of circulation, um, when the antibody goes into the cell, you get this toxic drug released and it kills the cell. So that's an additional mechanism over and above the mechanisms which are normally uh, used by antibodies. So these kind of armed antibodies are now the rage. Genentech uh, first made one um, which was uh, uh, took Herceptin and conjugated that to a metanzid, which is extremely cytotoxic. And that appears in patients who are resistant to um, the normal activity of Herceptin, this can actually give you extra killing by the use of this chemical conjugate. And now what they see is, well, why not stick this on all their cell-killing antibodies? There's no, no harm. It's just a matter of what the economics are of getting selective coupling at this point and, and whether your receptor is a receptor that's likely to internalize, because you do need to... to um, get this antibody inside the cell to release the toxins from it. Okay, another approach has been the development of bispecific antibodies. So this actually is a new function again, binding to two targets. So let's uh, think about what the rationale of this is. So what you can do, for example, the small company Covigen, um, which has taken a, a small protein domain and fused it to the C-terminus of the light chain, or in fact the heavy chain at this end. And this means then you can have the original activity of the antibody through its variable regions, but you can get you can you can make these small protein modules using the phage display technology uh, to another target. For example, um, in this case, if this is an anti-TNF antibody, uh, they've made um, these small modules to IL-17A. Now, that therefore means it can act by blocking TNF or by blocking IL-17A. And the beauty of this system is that the antibody is a very highly modular structure anyway, and you can just add extra modules to it. You try and do the same thing with a chemical drug, very difficult. You, you, you say, well, I'll put two chemical drugs together. It's usually they don't work. Very, very complex thing. This is straightforward. You just plug them in, plug and play, basically, in the case of antibodies. So these combine two targets, and the reason that this particular combination is up there is because this is one of this combo, this TNF and IL-17A, um, is, 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 there's evidence that both TNF and also IL-17A are involved in rheumatoid arthritis. So in fact, antibodies to TNF and IL-17A will separately block that activity. They appear to be different pathways. So these actually could have a synergistic effect. And so the hope is that, that 
Um, certainly in animal models they do. Uh, the hope is that if you develop that and put it into patients, that would actually be better. And the, the, the advantage of it would be, first of all, it may be more effective at acting. Secondly, um, not all patients respond to the anti-TNFs. So it actually gives you a wider market if there's another mechanism that they can, you can put together. So it means that you have a, you can, you can achieve more sales, you don't need to do lots of careful analysis, you just sort of take this or cover both those pathways. And the other interest in it is actually from the commercial guys. In fact, the commercial guys were the people who were really excited about this when we first discussed it with them. Because they said, well, there's lots of gen general anti-TNF antibodies out there. Um, we don't want to come along with number 10 anti-TNF antibody. How are we going to market that? Other people are established. But if you have an extra activity that's good marketing for, it's like toothpaste, fluoride, whitener, you know, um, breath freshener, all a lot. You have a standard toothpaste and then you can add these extra features to it. So they love it. The idea of being able to put on some extra modules and it gives you a huge marketing advantage and a way in which you can sell that antibody to medics. Um, um, and in fact, it's probably probably worth having. Uh, um, and, and, and I also think, what I can see clinically the advantage as well, is that with the anti, with, with anti-TNFs, to achieve the same reduction in inflammation, you probably have to put quite a lot of the anti-TNF antibody in. Um, the same would be true with the IL-17. If you've got them both there, you don't have to reduce the TNF levels by so much because you're blocking it by, by this independent pathway. And so actually, you don't need to profoundly inhibit TNF. Perhaps you don't have to inhibit prof as profoundly as you do with the vanilla flavored anti-TNF. So that is good because actually, uh, TNF is also involved in, in responding to bacterial pathogens and such like, and people, if you if you totally block their anti-TNF activity, um, then in fact they can come down with a variety of infectious diseases. So actually, you don't, you don't want to keep people under these for too long. And this, these may in some ways be a milder uh, way of dealing with the problem. Now what I put here really was to show another feature as to why these antibodies have been so successful. This shows the antibody, this shows the target, and this shows the disease. So let's look then at uh, the the, uh, a particular disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you can, you, so I've marked in thick lines those which are approved products, and in light lines those which are still under investigation. So rheumatoid arthritis, you can block by anti-TNF, also apparently by IL, anti-IL-6 receptor. <laughs> so you have the ability with the same disease, there's two different antibodies that may be available and I've just actually earlier said IL-17 might be available. It also turns out that, that rheumatoid arthritis, another way you can try to treat it is by killing off the, the B cells which are involved in the inflammatory process. So actually an antibody, rituximab, which knocks out the B cells, is also uh, sometimes used for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. So now if we look at the other side of it, if we take the same target, TNF, we can see that the the TNF, antibodies to TNF, can be used in multiple diseases. So we've got rheumatoid arthritis, uh, we've also got psoriasis, we've got Crohn's disease with those. And the beauty of this is that is you can make an antibody um, against a key biological mediator and find out it would have some interesting uses in a range of different conditions. And that actually has helped the market because people say, well, actually, even if it's not good enough for that, maybe we can try something else. Um, and you've just got to get your preclinical models in, you know, ducks in a row to achieve that. So this is just to say that new technology, uh, the, the things I've been describing already, also provides, it continues apace, it's providing new opportunities, and we can expect to see second generation antibodies coming into the market. One of the other advantages is it allows IP from the first generation to be extended. So, for example, imagine you've got an anti-TNF antibody and you put anti-IL-17 on it. If you've got that combo, uh, you can probably get, if you've got IP on that combo, then you can get, uh, you've got patent protection. You, your original, you can protect effectively your original anti-TNF antibody in combination with that new, that new possibility. So it's a way of evergreening your, um, 
these improvements offer a way of evergreening what you've got already. And that may be one of the motivations that Genentech has for its various um, uh, cytotoxic the drug fusions, which are extra killers, because if you can show the higher activity, you can then essentially, with your second generation <coughs> antibodies, you can drop your first generation, let the Indians make their biosimilars or whatever, and, and essentially use this innovative feature to, to give you a marketing advantage over, the, over the, those people coming in later. Um, so that really, I, I mentioned that already, and, and I think this provides opportunities both for startups and, and large pharmaceutical companies. So it's actually, it's, it's, the, the technology is in, should be interesting to everyone. Fortunately, large pharma are a bit more interested in the new technology, but uh, it still again tends to be the small biotech who are really at the vanguard of developing it. So they don't seem to have learned anything really. Um, so now I want to deal with um, an issue of pricing, because I think this is actually quite interesting and quite illuminating. Because this also provides new opportunities, as well as problems. So let's look at the cost of treatment. The cost of treatment with antibodies can range from $500 to $400,000 per course of treatment. So let's look at denosumab, it's prolia, treatment for osteoporosis. That's about $500 350 pounds in the UK. Um, cetuximab used for treating metastatic colorectal cancer, $30,000 per treatment. Soliris is the leader, this is for a, a relatively, this is for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which is a, a life-threatening disease, and it's the only, <coughs> the only possibility for it. And therefore, they can charge, even though the market is small, this thing is, I think, sells about $2 billion per year, because enough people have enough money and can be reimbursed at those sort of prices. So actually people often say antibodies are extremely expensive and that's a problem compared to chemicals. But I'm saying actually this tells you they don't have to be that expensive. In fact, it tells you it's the market that is dictating the price. If it works and people have some hope and they've got the money, then in fact it, it can be approved. And in particular with denosumab, I was very surprised they could offer that for $500. Um, the reason for that is that denosumab um, is, is, is a rank anti rank ligand um, antibody. That's having to compete with bisphosphonates. And in particular, not with the standard, bis so for example, osteoporosis, you take bisphosphonates. The bisphosphonates take pill once a week. They can give you severe stomach upset. Um, uh, but actually, they, can, they they're, they're, they're cause nothing to produce, and they're highly profitable. Um, for those people with stomach upset, uh, you, can, you can put them on a soluble bisphosphonate called Zelida, which they have an injection once a year. And that basically acts by, um, <laughs> as I understand it, by um, uh, 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 leading to some killing of the osteoclasts. So it's taken in actually like some kind of toxin. So, so basically, denosumab is, is probably better than soluble bisphosphonates but not so much better you could charge an arm and leg, no one's going to pay for it. So therefore they have to be, they can charge a little bit more than the soluble zelada bisphosphonate, but that's why their price is $500. The other reason is, and this is one of the fascinating things about antibody half-life, is they give a treatment once every uh, six months. And I thought to myself, well, <coughs> how come every six months, how can you get away with it? Has that antibody got an unusually long half-life? No, it doesn't. Half-life's 28 days. But because it's 28 days, and because the amount of rank ligand that you need to neutralize is very small, um, you can go through six half-lives um, and still be, have enough antibody in the serum to be able to neutralize the rank ligand. Now that actually is pretty exciting in my view, because if you can imagine now, with half-life extension strategies, as developed by Medimu, there will be a number of cases where you could probably have an antibody injection once a year. Now, compare having an antibody injection once a year with a pill every day. There's no comparison, in my view. So I think it's opening up the possibility, these half-life extensions, you know, start to make the whole issue of injectables, you know, quite, quite acceptable. So you can imagine going for a checkup once a year. It's like vets do, they vaccinate your dog, right? 
vets love having people having routine vaccination because they vaccinate, they can charge you enough for that, but they can also pick up other faults and worry you about other things that are wrong with your animal. And the beauty is that you know that people will be compliant. Because actually, you see it going? They can't stop taking their drugs. I actually think there'll be a great line in this for people who need to have um, uh, sex therapy, uh, anti-sex therapy. I mean, basically, they need, to, they need to have their sexual urges blocked because they are up to all sorts of things, like Jimmy Sal. So, I mean, you need to, you need to have, you know, you can never be sure he would take his pills, but, but if you can inject him, other than having a, a you know, plasmapheresis, uh, you wouldn't be able to get rid of it. So actually, I think it would be great, and we could probably ship a number of people out of jails if we could, uh, if we could give them a long-lived antibody treatment. So this is actually one of my law and order issues, like, you know, we can push the government for antibody therapy to be, Take it forward. So let's move on. Um, marketing, <laughs> marketing strategies. I mean, the, 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 there are other issues that sort of to do with the way you market these things. Um, if we look at Avastin, Avastin is against the ligand VEGF. So this is a ligand involved in um, the. Um, okay, so so VEGF is required. To, to stimulate the formation of blood vessels. And tumors, in particular, tend to release VEGF, and this stimulates the portion of, portion of the, the, the creation of blood vessels. And that is necessary to sustain the tumor. So one strategy for treating cancer is to add the, is to add Avastin, which is a full antibody, and you can, and therefore you can block the formation of blood vessels. Um, but they also uh, realize that actually another situation where you have formation of new blood vessels is in the eye with wet macular degeneration. And they were also aware, that the, 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 so they're both directed against the target VEGF. Um, but, but they, uh, um, the, the problem is you need some different doses. So you need tiny doses in the eye, but for a tumor you need very large doses. So if you want to produce this, so if you've got the antibody for, uh, as produced for, for treating cancer, uh, this effectively it could kill off your market for um, acute macular degeneration. So for example, if you look at the, um, the Lucentis, the, uh, um, this antibody, it, it sells for $1,600 per dose. The same dose of the Avastin would cost $42. So actually what Genentech did is they, Lucentis is actually a tweaked version of Avastin. So it's tweaked in two ways, it's got slightly higher binding affinity, but it's also lost its FC portion, so it's actually it's a FAB2 molecule, it's just got the antibody arms, which is enough just for the blocking. It's injected straight into the eye. And they have therefore been able to launch these two products for the same target with different prices on. And of course, what's happened now is people have thought, well, actually, let's take some Avastin and dilute it down and put it in the eye. And actually, uh, this is, I think, a trial that is now being conducted. But you see, NICE has only approved, has only approved Lucentis. It hasn't approved Avastin yet for, for macular degeneration. One of the issues, in case you're thinking of doing this, is that, um, the, 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 usually that usually that's fine for one dose, but actually, um, you have to worry about that, that vial which might get bacteria in it and such like. So actually it's be much better really if one could if, if one could um, take Avastin and then portion it down uh, in under sterile conditions. And so actually that is much more difficult to do on, on a um, on a commercial basis. So so at the moment though that if you go to India you will get that you can get if you have acute macular degeneration you can't pay and basically you can get a very cheap job done for about forty-two dollars from from some back street um, place, um, and they will uh, um, they can do that essentially because they're diluting down the acid. Um, but you might not want to have it under those conditions. So, so um, the other antibody that's sort of other issue where this marketing strategy has come in is the case of Campath, and I haven't got the uh, the details. I'm not really up to speed with all the details of this, but some time ago in, in I think it was the Guardian, or might have been the Observer. That there was a comment, basically, Campath, so this is the antibody, uh, the Lemtuzumab, which was used for treating non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the one I showed you blowing the tumor away, um, 
is, 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 has actually established a small market for treating BCIL. Um, and for that, it requires 1,000 milligrams over 12 weeks. But as a result of further work, it looks as though CAMPATH um, is very useful for treating the early stages of multiple sclerosis, in which course of treatment is 150 mg. So, what the, what they, when Cup, Sanofi took over Genzyme, which was the company involved in um, developing this antibody for multiple sclerosis, and are now pulling uh, the treatment for BCIL, because essentially they, 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 they don't have any other way around it. To, to maintain their potentially more lucrative multiple sclerosis market, they've had to pull out of this area here. So actually, this thing shows you that because you're going for these uh, central biological molecules, which can have a role in different diseases, it can actually, it can give you some quite complex marketing and pricing issues for your the products that you create, which is another reason for, for in fact, why Genentech did try to differentiate these here. And I think that therefore, uh, this is one of the other reasons why it could be advantageous to use some novel technology to achieve differentiation, like addition of other activities in conjunction with the vanilla flavored antibody. So the other thing to point out is there's actually, there are regulatory issues which also provide opportunities. Just to point out that, that antibodies, that there's not such a thing as generic antibodies. So this is a quote from Wikipedia, but you know, people will talk about generics. It doesn't really apply to antibodies. And in fact, the similar thing is biosimilars. And the reason for that is, if you've got a chemical, uh, you, can get, you can get HPLC in it at a mass spec, and you know if on NMR spectrum, you know it's that. That's not true in the case of antibodies. They're, they're so big that you actually can't be sure it's exactly the same chemical substance. They've got different levels of sugar, pre sugar processing, maybe the occasional deamidation of a bond somewhere. Um, and and you know, cells actually produce a mixture of different antibody species. Um, now, if you're, if you're an Indian uh, uh, generics company, or let's say by a similar company trying to do this with antibodies, you, you, do, you do have the actual product, you can get your hands on the product, but you're not allowed to have the originator's original clone or the cell bank, nor do you know the exact fermentation conditions or purification processes. That's secret, that's commercially secret. So actually this makes it very difficult to say you know, if, if you're an Indian trying to launch a Me Too product, it, it's very difficult to simply say, look, this is it, and therefore um, we should have a license for it because this is the same as Humira or Avastin. And the regulators essentially try to, this is actually, the regulators in some ways are protecting us from differences in impurities and breakdown products that could have serious health implications. But at the same time, they're actually making it very difficult to bring the prices down for these things. Because the regulators essentially require anyone coming with a new product to do some of the key clinical trials again, which of course means that they have to have a major cost. Now the beauty of that is, in my view, is that that is going to promote uh, innovation. So in other words, then why would you create another Humira when you could actually create uh, a Humira Plus? And so I think actually that's, it, it, it may be good. So, what I'm saying here is there are a number of different trends we've got. We've got high prices for some well-established antibody therapies. You know, the, the sheer market size of these, and the money people are making out of it, will certainly develop Me Too antibodies. But then they've got to face regulatory issues. And this will probably tend to drive product differentiation. Um, I also think that, that regulatory issues will may also favour the development of biobetters, so these, these things with extra features, bells and whistles on them. Um, and I think we also see it, because of the regulatory complexity, the existing antibody products are getting a much longer product life. So if the patent fails, um, it's actually quite difficult for other people. You don't, they don't go, the, the sales will start to drop off, but they don't go off the patent cliff that small molecule drugs do. And this is one of the reasons that large pharma has suddenly become excited. Because it's a possibility with all these strategies, you know, regulation, um, you, know, you can put up a legal smoke screen around that, and then you can uh, get your patent lawyers to fight everyone all the way down the line um, for the, on, on whether something is absolutely identical to your particular product for which approval was granted. Lots of opportunities for, 
for being able to defend your product even after the end of the patent expires. So I actually would say they've got a rosy future, but, but, but uh, for all sorts of reasons. But you need to be aware of what the trends are and the issues are. But you also need to be aware of another paradigm shift. And one possibility are bicycles. So actually, we thought maybe we could shrink an antibody. So this is the size of an side, sorry, sorry again. The size of an antibody uh, here. And this is the size of a bicycle, right down here. So we wondered whether some of the disadvantages of antibodies, whether we could, which in some cases are really due to the size, like they don't go through um, into the extravascular space, um, and you can't chemically synthesize them, which is certainly a disadvantage. Maybe you could overcome that by um, shrinking the antibody right down. And we came up with the idea that maybe if you, if you take a peptide with cysteines on it, you could effectively introduce by some um, great chemistry developed by um, a, a, a group in a company PepScan. You could, you could, you could cross-link it and create something which essentially is two loops. Peptide with two loops. We found that we could develop, we could, we could use the phage, we could make large repertoires of these things and cross-link them on the surface of phage under carefully defined conditions that didn't kill the phage. Um, and therefore we could create these and we could use the, the, the repertoire and the genotype phenotype selections that we've done to create very potent molecules which are quite constrained. They've got two loops, they don't have the six loops of antibodies, but actually in many cases that two loops is enough for the purpose. And therefore these represent a simple nugget, they're about 2,000 Daltons, but it's 15 or so amino acids long, can be made in very large, very large amounts by chemical synthesis. And if we look at the, um, uh, if we look at how they stack up compared to antibodies and chemicals, um, we can certainly get the same type of binding activities, we can get the same target specificity. Because they're smaller, we, we have to use some extra half-life extension strategies that are not as good as complete antibodies, but we can get them half-life to about 24 hours rather than 10 minutes as, as the unmodified molecule would be. We can uh, directly, we can't recruit cell killing, but again, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to put on a cytotoxic reagent in the same way Genentech has done, so I think in the end that will get solved. And they're, 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 they're big enough to be able to block protein-protein interactions. They're small enough to target pockets, you can get them outside the blood, so they will go into the, into the tissues. So far we haven't got them in cells, not, not to do anything useful inside cells. And you probably can't put them in the oral route, but you can make them by chemical synthesis. So this is a kind of another spectrum. It's got some advantages of each of the two classes, and some disadvantages of each of the two classes. I don't know whether that will be enough to make these things useful. But my own guess is there will be certain situations where where sort of novel technology of this type will be useful, and the question is identifying what is the clinical situation where that would be useful. I think in particular, for the formation of agonists, or I think topicals, those would be areas where these would be exceptionally useful. So that's just to give you a flavor that the antibodies may appear to be having it all their own way, but one needs to be able to recognize a paradigm shift when it comes. I don't yet know whether this is the paradigm shift, but there could certainly be others that will come. So I hope that's given you a, a flavour of um, the, uh, the world of antibodies, where they're going, what in the end might supersede them, or might be something else altogether. But I think it's a very interesting area. So even if we look at bicycles, even if in fact in the end they ended up dominating over antibodies, it was anti -te antibody technologies, potent selection approaches, which actually gave rise to them. So we can see all these ideas can spawn new ideas and new possibilities and I think we must be alive to the complete picture um, in, the, in, in innovation. So with that I will thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>